down there. Um, we, uh, the, the president of the food bank pinged us the other day asking. Okay, yeah, definitely. Sounds like Jeff might actually go to Puerto Rico in December to finalize the VA case project, by the way. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, let's Finally. let's talk after this because I, you know, we're the food bank gal is very keen to move forward, and we've been mm -hmm. late on getting some prices. Yeah, just got to take care of some business there. <laughs> All right. Yeah, perfect. might as well. <laughs> uh, we ready to go? I think we're ready to go. All of the gears are working, and the stream is live. So we'll keep an eye on the chat window and see if anybody has any questions. Let's do it. All right. Welcome to The Critical Path with Mary and Jason, a podcast about business development, company culture, and loving the place you work just a little bit more. This is episode 71, and we're talking about building a better world with Construction for Change and the Sextant Foundation. And we have some very special guests here today to share some good news. Mm -hmm. we, we really need that. Yep, and uh, we're looking forward to this one. We need to hear about some good things right now. I'm going to share some good news and, and hear about the good work that they're doing in their, their humanitarian organizations. Uh, so we have Shannon Bunsen and we have Kevin Hunter, and we're going to give you the chance to introduce yourselves. Uh, do we have any any uh, housekeeping before we get started? I don't think so. I mean, we've got our foreman basic training. We mm -hmm. rolled that out this week and started actually meeting with those guys and and gal. And uh, it's an excellent it's an excellent group, and I'm really looking forward to it. So you'll be hearing more about that on the podcast. So let's get started. So Shannon, let's go ahead and have you introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, what you do. Sure. I'm Shannon Bunsen. I am the executive director of the Sextant Foundation and sustainability project manager at an engineering firm called Mazzetti, which really founded the Sextant Foundation. Um, and this job just sort of, uh, I'm very grateful and privileged to have the opportunity to do this because it was kind of an add-on to my job. And it has really added a lot of value to my workplace. Yeah. And so what's the core function of the Sextant organization, Sextant Foundation? Yeah. So we do clean energy and clean water projects around the world, uh, largely in limited resource settings and in places that have been hit by natural disasters, uh, focused on healthcare and schools and, and critical needs. Appreciate that. So Kevin, you work with Construction for Change. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got roped into that. Yeah, well, um, you know, thanks for uh, for having uh, Shannon and I on. This is exciting. We're 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 partners over the past few years, and so it's it's great uh, to share the um, the podcast with her. Um, again, my name's Kevin Hunter. I uh, am the executive director of Construction for Change. Uh, we exist simply to help uh, um, organizations and and ministries of health and ministries of education around the world in under-resourced settings build the infrastructure they need so that people can get healthier, uh, more educated, and, and ultimately have more economic opportunity and mobility. So uh, we build schools, hospitals, um, clinics, and production facilities uh, globally as well as domestically. And, uh, and we you know, part of our magic is we do that through a, a set of uh, wonderful and collaborative partners mm -hmm. uh, like the Sexton Foundation. So let's just pretend like I know nothing, because arguably that's true, <laughs> about about the work that, that the two of you do. Um, Shannon, you had mentioned something about the projects that, that you're working on where you're focused on bringing clean water and, and I think that's a no-brainer. Of course, clean water is, is important, and we're talking probably about filtration systems and pumps and wells and, and those sorts of things. Maybe even I'd love to hear more about in, in detail about the projects. Go into deep nerd mode about the construction methods. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> but you also mentioned power projects. And, and that's something that if you think about the privilege that we have here in the States, we totally take water and power for granted. But I think that the key part that I want to hear from both of you on is we know that, that water is important. Water has long been important in terms of humanitarian aid, uh, but power, I, I think that this is the first real time that I've heard that power is a huge concern. So talk to me a little bit about, 
why power is so significant in, in the countries that you're working in right now? Yeah, I can start with that one. So uh, I'll start with an example, maybe. In both Sierra Leone, uh, they have unreliable power. And so there are lots of, uh, you know, intermittent interruptions. And when the power goes down in a critical place like a hospital, that can cause big issues. Um, this is not just the case in Sierra Leone. This is a, a problem in lots of places around the world. Um, we got connected through another amazing partner of ours, Project Hope, to this hospital that had a NICU and they had all these babies, these tiny babies hooked up to oxygen concentrators that need consistent power. And whenever the power would go out, they, the nurses would have to run from one building to another with these little babies in their arms and try to get them connected back up to uh, oxygen. And so when they reached out to us, they said, we want a solar battery system. We need to have liability. This is, you know, dangerous for everyone involved and really um, just something that these healthcare workers should not have to be dealing with. And they it certainly shouldn't be something that the moms and dads of those babies should have to be dealing with. And so we um, did, it was a super easy install and a very small project, but it made a huge difference for them in their ability to deliver uninterrupted care and to get uh, just eliminate this huge risk for these kiddos. So, so the power is, yeah, that's just, it's, it's the intermittent power that, that was the problem, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, if you need them to, to keep them alive, if you need the power consistent to keep them alive, I mean, this is a situation where you're literally saving babies by providing constant power. Mm-hmm. So, Kevin, yeah. do you have any thoughts on, on the role that, that power plays in the countries where you're working? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in fact, it's, it was one of our first projects with, uh, with Shannon and her team. Um, we were um, working together in uh, the country of Dominica, which is down the Caribbean chain. And after 2017, um, the... The, uh, the hurricane came through, wiped out, um, you know, a huge percentage of, uh, of the, the, the island. It's an island country, wiped out roads, wiped out school buildings. And we were able to, with um, Sexton, to put some solar panels on these schools. And because all the, all, they had no power and trying to think through long term, um, you know, what power needs would a community have? So it's a mountainous island with little communities scattered around the, the island and relatively um, were left unaccessible by the storm. And so um, our project was to go in, put um, solar panels on top of, you know, re, um, hard, they call it hardening of, of buildings now to survive storms put solar systems on top of schools with some battery life so that um, in case uh, of the, the need on the next storm, community members could go to the school. Um, there was um, certainly a battery power that would allow for three days energy where people could charge their phones, uh, refrigerate their medicines, um, and, and just make sure they're in communication with the rest of the world. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, serving a community of maybe 5,000 people, but hugely impactful for those community members to be able to communicate with the outside world, to be able to uh, keep their insulin refrigerated. Uh, so those kinds of things, um, you know, power, that, that's more of a micro little system. Mm -hmm. We're beginning to work with uh, the ministry um um, a number of the ministries in Dominica to think through a 10 year plan where they're talking about redoing all kinds of infrastructure as they want to become the first net zero country in the world and convert all of their fossil fuel energy over to passive, um, passive type things. So it's so you know, obviously related to the climate change. It's a huge issue right now. So the, the energy projects that you're talking about, it's not just about providing uh, power for your cell phones or providing power for educational needs. It's, it's providing kind of an auxiliary backup 
in the case that that your whatever grid you have in place goes down, the whole community then could kind of fall back to the yep. school where where we could get a couple days of power for those critical functions. I think that's yeah. something that that we, we typically wouldn't even think about. So we actually have a question from Goda, uh, Goda Bapuji. Uh, so she says that she works on clean water efforts as part of uh, her work in a circular economy. So this is a phrase that I'm not super familiar yeah, with. It's not one I've heard. Um, is, are there any circular aspects uh, or economic aspects that you're, you're aware of in terms of how power or water play into the ability to kind of move forward? Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not quite sure what the circular economy is either. Other than, you know, it, it's it, this notion of being generative. You know, so how how can we get a clean power solution? How do we create new jobs? What kind of production facilities are needed? Um, and then, you know, the construction process of those facilities kicks in. So it's this ongoing generative cycle of, of well-being in a community. Well, and one, one detail that I'm aware of, and, and this is just from years ago of watching whatever documentaries, <laughs> uh, is that the number of hours that people would have to walk to get clean water, to charge their cell phone, because they would mm -hmm. have a cell phone and cell service, uh, but they would walk for miles and miles every day. And so if you look at how much production or how much we could spend how much time we could spend on other things like education. Uh, yeah. When we remove some of those barriers, I think that, that we can do an incredible amount of good. So what, what should people listening know about humanitarian work? What are, what are some misconceptions that are out there uh, that, that we should clear up? What do we think, Shannon? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess what's freshest in my mind based on what Kevin was just talking about is really that the work we're doing is, uh, sure, we might be donating assets to a community and bringing volunteers there to do work, um, but it's very much about helping communities build their own resilience mm -hmm. and their ability to rely on themselves in the face of a disaster, in the face of climate change impacts. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important to approach every project that way. Mm -hmm. um, Someone actually in a meeting just earlier today gave this really great analogy or just way of thinking about doing projects in another place as, you know, we are guests there. And so that's, you know, a good reminder to approach all of this work really with respect and um, just, you know, treating other people with dignity, no matter whether you feel like you're the ones with expertise and coming in with resources to help. Um, yeah. And share that as a reminder. So, Kevin, what what would your response be to that? What is a misconception that some people have about humanitarian work? What should we be thinking about or or understand differently? Yeah, well, I, I think Shannon raised a really important point, and I'll just piggyback on it. I think a big misconception is we have um, a monopoly on all the wisdom and technical capacity and assets um, and those other places don't. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the big lesson I've learned over the years is there are some remarkable uh, people that have that are way more creative, mm -hmm. way more talented, um, way more um, resilient uh, than than some of our systems and processes. And so the big, the big, um, you know, aha for me has always been, oh my gosh, we have so much to give each other. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And and so how do we come to to Shanna's point as guests, but become as equals, not as an over under type of relationship. Um, usually the, the the people that get involved, the partners and the staff that get involved with our projects from around the globe. They always come back and say, "I'm better mm -hmm. um, as mm -hmm. as a human, um, as a part of this whole thing than anything I possibly might have left behind and uh, and helped build." So um, that that's a big one, and that's obviously you know shaped out of one's worldview and and all of those you know types of things. But for me, that's that's a really important piece. So uh, if if 
people are, are thinking about uh, humanitarian work and, and you're saying essentially we're better together. We're, we're better when, when we have the creativity and input from everybody. Um, I think we've been spending a lot of time in diversity space in trying to help people uh, diversify construction because uh, construction is, is one of the least diverse industries that, that's on this planet. There's or, a lot of work to be done. Or let's say, at least in the U.S. Um, and one of the, the points for improving diversity is that our problem solving gets better when we have voices and, and input from different influences. Different from, ways of looking at problems. Right. Think about it this way. Food is better when you have all of these cultures to pull from to make something amazing. And I think that, that the same is true for all of the countries that, that you're working in, uh, that, that we're better and we're stronger and we're smarter when we have the core input. Just because they haven't achieved the same level of education that we have, it's not the same thing as intelligence or wisdom. Uh, that, that accrued knowledge is something completely different. And I think that when you bring that baseline of, of basic services to those people, then you give them the opportunity to participate and actually contribute uh, to all of the problems that we're facing. Uh, and I think that that's, that's just really admirable. Well, and in fact, I think living in that environment where mm -hmm. the power is intermittently going down and we have to solve these problems on the fly, they're going to have a certain amount of experience with important of the moment problem solving that's going to be really useful. So to help give everybody mm -hmm. kind of a picture of, of the different way of life, and you work in many different countries and they're all a little bit different, um, can you give me... Any cost of living comparisons or uh, we were talking with uh, a Goda and she said, I have a hard time spending five dollars on a coffee because I know how far that will go in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you have any any factors or, or anything that you would share to help put in perspective the, the difference of economy? Shannon, what do you think? Yeah, you know, uh, before we send we send a couple of volunteers from the United States over to some of these places that we do work in. And it's always a balance, right, between sending volunteers and working with local labor. Um, and we do a lot to prepare them to go and share things with them, like cultural expectations, whether you want to have cash or card, what, um, what sort of things you'll be able to buy out and what sort of things you need to bring. And so, you know, a, I don't know a good way to thinking of all the different places that we've sent people around the world to answer that question other than kind of like what Kevin was just saying. People come back feeling not only like, you know, they're better people and have a better perspective on uh, other ways of living, but just a really deep sense of gratitude for what we do have. And also, I would venture to guess people come back also feeling like they can't waste five bucks on a cup of coffee. I certainly feel that way too, <laughs> just from some of the places that we visited. But yeah, really um, this sort of work in communities that to have a very just different way of living and different standard of living really changes your perspective on, on what you do back at home. So Kevin, do you have any thoughts on that question? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it, it is a complex and multi-dimensional kind of issue. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously uh, the dollar uh, goes a lot farther. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I think at the end of the day, it's a stewardship question. So which is go to cup of coffee question. Um, where, what do I do? How do I steward my five bucks most effectively, which has the most impact? Um, you know, a um, $20,000 in um, rural West Africa will build a school, you know, at least a, a two room uh, schoolhouse. And, and that includes everything soup to nuts, you know, start to finish. And so you're, you know, you're, you're kind of going, boy, um, the impact and the results of those kinds of expenditures um, can be pretty dramatic. And and that's, you know, it's, it's you know, over here in the States, we call that, how do you leverage up uh, impact? Um, so there's all kinds of opportunities to, to say, boy, what 25 grand, you know, it's the cup of coffee. I could spend 25 grand here 
and not even get halfway through a set of blueprints for a school. Yeah. And there you can design it, construct it, close it out and be complete, um, you know, for a whole, a whole facility. So, you know, that's, that's, you know, I think what, you know, Shannon and I and, and the, the multitude of partners around us, that's, we get excited about that because for just a little bit, you can do just a whole lot and then learn and engage and be in relationship with phenomenal people doing really, you know, phenomenal work around the globe. So like everyone, uh, we're, we're struggling with COVID and getting through it kind of one foot at a time. Uh, how has how has COVID impacted the work that you do? Because obviously we're not flying on planes anytime real soon, or let's say for mm -hmm. a period of time we weren't. Uh, how, how has that impacted the work that you do? Are there pro projects that are just kind of mothballed or, or how are you approaching that challenge? That's a good question. Go ahead, Shannon. Yeah, so a, a couple of our projects that were in the works have been slowed down. Um, just due to travel restrictions and, and quite honestly, normal things that slow down construction projects that uh, then would tee us up to do clean energy work. Um, but we, what we've done with a couple of current projects is just shift our model from the volunteer labor that we send over and meet with local labor to just kind of remotely supporting a team. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing a lot of Zoom calls and a lot of, you know, just online communications and got a couple of, um, you know, proposals from a few different local installers. And typically we would try to really, if there is local expertise, we want to leverage that as much as we possibly can anyway and send like one or two volunteers just to collaborate with them and make sure that, everything happens according to plan. Mm -hmm. And now we're just uh, doing it a little bit differently, but it certainly hasn't stopped our work. Um, I think COVID is challenging everybody to just look at things differently and get creative and find a new way. And if anything, there's even more need. So the, the, the kind of magic of getting these projects to work is having the need, having the funding and having the labor, the support, volunteers, whatever, all lined up at the same time. And um, that is still happening with a couple of our projects, thankfully. Um, yeah, just, just adapting. Do you have anything to add to that, Kevin? Yeah. Um, you know, similarly, we, we had to pull up people, a couple of our project managers that were on site, we had to pull them out of, um, I think, a couple people in Africa and one in India. Um, and so some of that shifted over uh, to virtual um, management, uh, Zoom calls and all of that. Some of the projects were slowed down uh, and paused and now they're kicking back up. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we had begun to already pivot to before COVID was how do we begin to build out a stable of volunteers and and um kind of pro, not pro bono, but low bono project managers that were located in geographic hubs. Mm -hmm. And so we were actually able to redeploy a number of our East African project managers uh, to projects in the region and, and similarly in West Africa. So, you know, like Shannon said, it's it's this, this we were fortunate because we already started that, but, you know, it, it actually then pivots you to probably a better, more sustainable, sustainable and more locally contextualized uh, set of experts to bring in, help get them trained up to be able to do more closer in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We also um, related to COVID, um, two of our amazing partners, um, HDR, which I think is the world's large, third largest uh, design firm and adaptive uh, architecture, um, a nonprofit firm they put their heads together and came up with our construction team about a, a boilerplate for what what a what a remote um, COVID-19 response unit could look like, mm -hmm. and and began to put some uh, process flows, architectural designs, so that communities could build it or retrofit an existing facility, or even put up a temporary facility 
to respond uh, to the to the pandemic in their community. And um, so, you know, in some ways it opened up another opportunity for us to serve some of these places that um, without our resource, it, it would have taken maybe longer and and uh, and cost more money. So we're actually just starting on our second response unit in um, in the small country of Togo in, in West Africa, mm -hmm. uh, where we're starting a, a, a multi-building infectious disease compound with the Ministry of Health there. So again, great partners coming up with a great concept and we're offering it kind of open source out to the world. And I think there have been a lot of great inventions that have come out of COVID that we wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, so I have a question. I'll pull you off the outline for a Go minute for here. Uh, so I know, Shannon, you're talking about having local experts and local contractors. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I hear Kevin say that we could build a school for $20,000. And so my question is, I know that, you know, I told you before that we did a little work with Habitat for Humanity. But there, we're building houses using the same tools, same methods, same everything as any other house. It's just... It is all... exactly the same, but mm -hmm. you're donating your time. We're just helping out. Uh, but, you know, in these different countries, I know Jason was having a conversation about someone had said, maybe you could create some training to help them learn how to build in their communities. And the answer was, we don't really know what they're building with or how mm -hmm. they're building. So what do you guys, when you go and help out places, mm -hmm. are you using kind of the same methods we use here and you're bringing them into the community? Or are you using kind of building methods that they use there? Or do you have to cobble that together somehow? Because, you know, if you're using some uh, local construction method in an area in order to install solar mm -hmm. panels, you're going to need to kind of cobble yeah. that together. So solar panels you can't build on site. <laughs> you can't. Uh, bringing steel to a specific site could be just really impossible or, or cost ineffective. Uh, so how do you respond to, yeah. to dealing with building material challenges? Yeah, how does that all work? Yeah, well, Kevin will be able to speak to this, I think, a lot more with all of his construction projects at CFC. Um, but yeah, on our end, it's just a matter of getting creative with whatever you have. I mean, we've got projects in Puerto Rico where our teams can just run over to Home Depot if they need something and get the, get the typical equipment. And then we have projects where it would take you a long time to find anything that might have what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And so you just really have to get creative with what's available locally and tap into, like you were talking about earlier, just that local wisdom and knowledge. I mean, um, even in places where we work, where there's maybe not local solar expertise, but there are local laborers, um, people know how to make things work. And so it's a matter of problem solving together. And our volunteers uh, very much tap into that and take advantage of um, those learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. I mean, things that look different are, um, you know, in some cases we have to worry a little bit more about fancy solar equipment growing legs and walking away. So we have to do, whether that's through theft or through uh, hurricanes and just stronger winds than we experience where I live here in Seattle, Washington. <laughs> And so there's um, there's a lot of that that goes on, but yeah, I'd love to hear Kevin speak to building materials and what I I know that your projects um, certainly don't look the same around the world. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's you know a lot of it depends in our context is where you're building. I mean, you know, if you're building something in downtown Nairobi, um, or you're building a health clinic in in rural. Uh, Uganda, right? Um, a, a lot of it is just some of the the tools and and some of the approaches that are different. It doesn't mean the end result is is any less viable. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the reasons we exist as an organization on behalf of the the organizations we build for and help them do the construction management is we want to keep them on timeline, keep them on budget. And make sure that the building that they paid for and designed is what is actually delivered to them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, we, we have a, um, a a really high value of anything that that we're doing that could help the local professionals do their job better. Maybe it's approaches or methodology. You know, we certainly want to share, but we'll always start with well listening to what they do. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, they don't have cranes and all the equipment and the scaffolding systems we have. I mean, if you look at some of these, we built a, a six story um, seismically, um, you know, retrofitted um, building in, in Nepal and these scaffolding systems they use look scary to any American that would walk up, but they were unbelievably strong. Mm -hmm. and, and they had systems for getting um, the hot and the mortar mix and the bricks is up these six stories, very different than how we would do it, but no less effective. Mm -hmm. And so there, if there's anything that we could bring that, that could help them do that with how we measure, you know, the, the material for uh, the slump of mortar that's going into a, a brick facility. Those are the things that, that we're always looking to say, um, have you thought about doing it this way? Uh, kind of this appreciative inquiry kind of, um, kind of uh, methodology. I, you know, I'm the wrong person to be having this conversation. So I better shut up because if, <laughs> you know, my construction staff hear me talk about anything more, they might, you know, um, I might get in trouble, but you know, it's, it's, it's our, our just like Shannon, our, our move is what's available locally. And then, you know, where, what do we need to do to make sure that the building is is built to the specifications that they deserve just like you know we deserve in downtown manhattan right so yeah. I, i've got a i've got a good question for the both of you here uh so there's a little bit of lead in uh, we have a concept that we use all the time called filling in the gap and the idea is this is a human superpower that we have if we if we see the head of a tiger on this side of the tree and a tail of a tiger on this side of the tree our human brain fills in the gap to tell us that there's a whole tiger there, not just two halves of a tiger, right? So filling in the gap is, is a superpower that we have and we tend to do it when we don't understand something. If there's missing information, we typically fill it in with the worst possible thing we can imagine. Uh, so if, for example, your spouse doesn't come home until three o'clock, you fill in the gap with some really bad outcomes, even though it might not be true. So how that relates to this conversation is when we're talking about donation or trying to help in the world, trying to make sure that our, our dollars are, are being uh, cared for with good stewardship, how do, we, how do we fill in the gap? How do we help people fill in the gap with, with good information so that they don't rush to fill in the gap with something uh, where we're, they're concerned about, they're so concerned about corruption and abuse uh, that they never then donate or they never then actually get involved, get involved to help. So how do we, how do we kind of steer or, or help fill in that, that conversation with information? Mm. Yeah, I think I've been going first every time. Do you want to take this one first? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, first I, I think it starts with don't be naive, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, there every context i don't care if it's you know on k street in washington dc you know um wink wink or if it's you know rural uganda um there's there's these forces out there that lead to graft and and uh you know this unscrupulous activity right so walk in with your eyes open and and don't be naive secondly do your research um you know, uh, organizations like the Sexton Foundation and Construction for Change, that's kind of what our, what, that's what our magic is, right? We, we know how to go into these situations, uh, understand the local lay of the land, you know, whether it's with our local staff or our pre-con trips, go in, ask the questions, understand the labor situation, what contractors are available, get the right references, and, and that's, that's where we can help people that want to get plugged in and get involved with us is we ensure that those kinds of things are, are minimized. On the, you know, it, they always exist um, and there's, there's nothing 100%, but, um, but we can help make sure that dollars are stretched, people's talent and time is stretched, um, and that they're, that they're maximized 
because we're we're we know the context and uh, and we're able to to ensure that that those kinds of things aren't uh, happening with any kind of frequency. To, to help vet some of that. Yeah, and there's a phrase: "Better is good." And I think you touched on something really important, Kevin, that yes, corruption does exist. And yes, those things will happen. But as long as you're, you're working with organizations that are, they, they have good reputations, they're well known, they've been around for a while, uh, your, your money is going to be safer and, and spent better with those folks. And I think that that just by calling out that, yes, corruption does exist and it does happen sometimes, but it's not all the time. And that most certainly shouldn't cause us to hesitate or, or stop us from helping a community, uh, even if only 40 percent gets through or even if only 80 percent gets through. It's better to do the right thing uh, yeah. in, in that and capacity. And, and there's great organizations out there doing great work, mm -hmm. you know, and I, you know, I, I, I think to walk in and and paint everyone with a, a bad mm -hmm. brush of negative and broken and, and unscrupulous isn't the fa isn't the case. There's okay. a lot of great people doing great work. Yeah, Shannon. Yeah, yeah. I think it's very much just about those front end and then ongoing relationship building. And you know, we build a lot of um, trust with the partners that we work with. And actually, one of the things I learned pretty early on from CFC was how to do um, a good evaluation of what a what a good partner will be for your organization. And I, I'm a relationship builder. I'm you know just trying to make friends with everybody that I work with. And so, if I can get to that place of trust with anybody that we're doing a project with, that's that's really ideal and what I aim for. And then I think as far as, you know, how our, our dollars get spent, it's just about transparency and telling donors, you know, exactly what we're doing with our money. Um, and I think that's something that every nonprofit, you know, is striving to do. Mm -hmm. See, another thing that Construction for Change does really well is tell people, if you give this much money, that's exactly what this could support mm -hmm. in terms that are really tangible and also just, you know, um, helps build that that idea of or that trust in knowing that your money is going to go somewhere and do something for someone. Mm -hmm. And also really that stewardship thing we were talking about before and understanding, you know, the hundred dollars here that might not mean very much to you can equate to this much bigger thing somewhere else. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So what is something in, in your time with Construction for Change and, and with Sexton Foundation. What is something that has happened to you or something that you've done, something that, that you were challenged with that was much harder than you expected? What is, what is something that happened that, that really kind of maybe changed who you are or may, made you see something a little bit differently? What do you think, Kevin? I feel like there's a whole wealth of um, <laughs> yeah. potential... Yeah, no, you know, I think, and I'll go back to a, you know, a cool chapter in, in the, the history of, of, of construction for change. Um, a, a dear friend of, of mine and my wife, and we went through undergrad together, and so kind of family friends, um, she was diagnosed with HIV and then AIDS just from a blood transfusion giving birth to their first, first child. And, you know, fast forward 30 years later, her family um, and, you know, she's been living with AIDS for, you know, uh, a long time, over 30 years. Her family said, hey, let's do something to honor uh, our mom uh, survival. And um, <clears throat> they ended up um, committing to raise bucks to help build 30 health clinics around the world. It was called the 3030 Project. And. 27 of them now are completed and we're, uh, the remaining three will be finished in, um, in this next year, 2021. And, and the whole premise of it was how do we make sure um, that, that people have access to good health care? Um, so, you know, Julie survived all these years because she had that access, you know, here in Seattle, one of the world's, 
you know, epicenters for, for good headache, you know, health research and treatment. And so, you know, the, the big thing I've learned over the years was um, there are places that um, people continue to get sick. People continue to, you know, catch uh, I, HIV and AIDS. And yet there are they're three or four days of walking just to get to a rundown, inadequate health facility. Mm-hmm. Um, and so wouldn't it be great if, if, you know, 30 more communities, hundreds more communities had access to some basic health care that treated people um, in a way that allowed them to um, live and to be with a part of their family and communities in a profound way. And so, you know, the big story is what I've learned, you know, in, in these last five years is that in a more acute way of how um, how there's this, this huge gap between access and people that don't have access. And, and, you know, and so then it, you know, the exciting part for our little organization is we get to be a part of not, you know, changing everyone's future, but for those 30 communities, for those villages, for those individual families, um, we've played a role to, to help that happen in a profound way. And then all the partners that have helped us do that, um, they all get to play a role in, in helping close that access gap in a, in a pretty profound way. So when, when Mary was young in middle school, was it sixth grade or something? She started a tutoring program at, at her middle school and it still runs today. Uh, and at, but when our kids were young, we started a, the first science fair at their local elementary school. And our daughter's 17, and it still runs today. And mm-hmm. there are these seeds that you get to plant in life, and sometimes they stick around and actually continue to do good. But the stories Amen. that we have are, are teeny tiny flecks of, of goodness that we put mm-hmm. out in the world compared to something like 30 something medical like building clinics. a clinic, yeah. Yeah. So I, it's amazing. I, yeah, it's a great story. So thank you for sharing that. Shannon, what did you have? What, what was harder than you thought? Uh, what was more profound than you thought it would be? And it, I was trying to think of it while Kevin was talking, but I couldn't because he's talking about our dear friend, Julie. So I, I don't know if I came up with anything good in that did time. He, did he take um, doors? Kind of, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. That is his story. That is Construction for Change's story um, in 3030. Yeah, I, you know, I am just continually challenged in this job and uh, profoundly impacted by with everything that happens in it, really. Um, I think some some things that have maybe been harder than I expected, We that Puerto Rico project that we did with Construction for Change, where we, Kevin alluded to it earlier, we were identifying a bunch of sites to be part of a cold chain that would have solar and battery backup for specifically for vaccine refrigerators and for insulin storage so that it could be temperature controlled. And in the same case of Sierra Leone, when the power goes out, that would still be able to keep that important stuff at the right temperature. And so what ended up being really hard about that project was that we were looking for the right sites. And so we were running around doing these site visits, meeting with folks, long before COVID. So that sounds a little creepy right now, running around to a bunch of different sites and meeting with people. But at the time it was, um, it was wonderful and also wonderfully hard because we would meet with someone and for just one reason or another, maybe it was the structure, maybe it was the kind of just access to the location. uh, Maybe there was just a better option down the road. We would meet with folks and then end up um, not working with them and working with another site down the road. And in a way, it's, um, you know, it's like a big responsibility to become one of these sites. because. So, so you're kind of picking winners here. Yeah, well, and it's it, it felt that's what was hard about it was that we had to say, uh, we're going to go with you and not you. Mm-hmm. But uh, we had to do our due diligence to pick the right sites. Yeah. So, yeah, that just um, that ended up being difficult because you met with wonderful people and then ended up telling them, yeah, we weren't going to give this asset to your location and, you know, kind of 
um, yeah, and had, this, had to be selective. In, in this <laughs> case, you're not talking, you're probably not talking about two places. You're probably talking about several sites. Oh, a bunch. This is a process that you have to go through all the time in terms of yeah. evaluating what is the best spot. And it means that, that when you say yes to one, you're, you're by no. its very nature saying no to everybody else. That's so. Right. Um, what is what are tangible things that that listeners can do? What can people do to to get involved if if they're looking to donate time or or skill? Uh, what what should people know or what should people think about in terms of getting involved? What are good first steps to mm -hmm. take? Yeah, yeah. You wanna go? Sure. Um, so on our end, I, I was thinking about this, you know, our, like I said, our old model was get some wonderful volunteers and send them around the world to do good work. And since we're not really sending people around the world, but we're still doing work, there are different ways to help um, from wherever you are. So we actually, I was thinking about this one colleague of mine at Mazzetti, um, Brian Hageman, he shared with me one time, he hasn't, I don't think actually gone on any of our sextant projects, but he is one of those um, just really thoughtful, kind-hearted people, and also a connector who, as soon as we had an opportunity that he heard about, he would reach out to folks. And through the process of doing so, he actually found us a couple of amazing volunteers um, who were just industry partners. You know, he was talking to a vendor rep once, and he was talking to an Oshpod plan reviewer in California once. And um, what he heard from those people that he effectively recruited for us was that this is the type of opportunity that, you know, engineers specifically, because that's typically who we're working with, engineers, electricians, tradespeople, um, you know, it's, it's, we're often doing kind of invisible or maybe thankless work. And when you do a project like this, even if you're helping it from afar, there's just so much gratitude for the people who are using their technical skills to really do good for, for other people in the world. And so um, I hope that that feeling still comes through as much if you're, you know, just sitting at your computer doing it versus being there physically on the job. But I've got volunteers who are still helping me plan projects right now, scope out projects, contact so, local so laborers. If, if people want to get involved, though, what do they do? Mm -hmm. They reach out to me. They, we have a, a volunteer interest form where we try to get a sense of what people can do, what they want to do, what their experience is. And this is at um, sextantfoundation.org? Absolutely, yep. Um, and also they can send us project opportunities. And, um, you know, we're always looking to, another thing that's really important to us is taking young engineers and people who really want to build more of that hands-on uh, experience and just around the world experience. We love finding people who are willing to mentor them. That's really important for us. I know mentoring matters to all of our organizations. Um, so that's another way to give back no matter what age you are and whether you want to go somewhere or just help, help other folks from the comfort of your home. Kevin, so how can people get involved? Yeah, um, well, thanks just for the uh, the invite to, to ask. And, you know, there's there's uh, obviously we're, we're always looking for if people don't have energy or time or the wherewithal to, to get involved on a project level, you know, we're always looking for, for funding to help some of our, our work go. So uh, again, it, all this stuff is available on our website. We're, we're just redoing our website. It will be done by the end of the, the month, but you know, there's still our website is up, but um, so that's that's one way. The second thing is we're always looking for design firms to get plugged in. We've got this unbelievable um, network of, of uh, architectural design firms, civil engineering firms, um, MEP firms that that have the capacity and want to get plugged in. Um, and they we've got, you know, two of the three largest firms in the world, all the way down to small local firms. And we can use everybody to help be a part of bringing great design to, to hard places, right? Um, the third thing is we have anyone who's interested in becoming a project manager, whether it's virtual or on site, um, there's a way to get plugged in to do that, both pre-con trips and actually go 
be somewhere for six months to 12 uh, to 12 months. We just placed a guy down in the British Virgin Islands, which doesn't sound like hard duty, um, <laughs> but he's down there for for three years uh, helping rebuild schools from Hurricane Maria. Mm-hmm. Um, we also have a thing called the Change Fellows. Uh, we have a huge, um, you know, admiration and respect for women and people of color getting into the trade. We were talking about that earlier. The whole Change Fellow program is designed around um, getting those populations plugged into sites um, with a mentor that can help build their capacity and help build their resume uh, so they can take a, a next new step toward, um, toward you know, their livelihood. Um, and then we're, we're uh, you know, we're always looking for uh, new opportunities. Um, Domestically, we we just uh, signed an agreement with an organization that builds emergency shelters that are addressing uh, homelessness and disaster response across the U.S. Um, and so we're looking for uh, for GCs that will help us deploy their volunteers with their company on a local social impact um, project to to get these emergency shelters set up so that our homeless population can have some security and dignity in, in literally um, locations around the country. So we're looking for GCs that might want to get in plugged in with us. So design firms, GCs, individuals with project management uh, skills, um, change fellows and funding, all those are ways that, that you can get plugged in and, and become part of the, the CFC team. So, so folks can... Did you have some? Well, I think that's all such a really good point because mm-hmm. when I think about our involvement with Habitat for Humanity when we were young, I was 18 and Jason was 19, and we didn't have any money to give to mm-hmm. any organization. You know, money's always a great way to help out because money can do lots of things. But we didn't have any money to give, and yet uh, it was a super small roofing company, one guy, one crew, Jason's brother. And it was really just Jason and his brother, and they'd take a Saturday, and they'd go put a roof on. And it didn't cost us anything, and it was a way that we were able to help. So I think right now, with all the kind of tumult in the world, the idea that you can help using your skills, you can help by showing up and and using whatever skills it is that you already have. Uh, And I think having that message out there is really important, because people always think, if I don't have a bunch of money to Mm -hmm. donate, then I can't make a difference. So if people want to donate their money or their time, both of them are appreciated. Uh, Kevin, where can they find Construction for Change? Construction for Change, uh, all spelled out. Um, There's no numbers, no four. It's just F-O-R. Constructionforchange.org. Great. And uh, um, all just, you know, push on the buttons that ask for more information, and it'll hopefully guide you through... uh, uh, to the right people, the right team. And and post-COVID, I'm sure they can come to your office and ask you questions too. Absolutely. Yeah, we have an office in uh, in Seattle and all that information is on, on the website. Right. And Shannon, if, if folks want to find the Sextant uh, Foundation, where will they find you? Yeah, sextantfoundation.org. Um, I'm also located here in Seattle. We're headquartered technically in San Francisco, mm-hmm. and the folks who contribute to Sexton Foundation are all over the place. Um, but you can find me at sbunson at sextantfoundation.org, um, all just spelled out. And yeah, I was going to put a plug too. I, I, I know Kevin has the, the Brick Club, and we also have. Uh, not with such a great name, but a similar easy way for people to contribute financially if they don't have time and they don't have much money, five bucks a month, um, whatever whatever you can give. We love and accept monthly contributions of any kind too. That's great. Can we get a handbag or a tote? <laughs> <It's not laughs> we, you get a t-shirt from Construction get, for Change. You get oh. t-shirts from us too. Oh, and t-shirts. <laughs> Amped up. So you're okay. starting to look a little threadbare. There we go. <laughs> well, we really, we really appreciate both of you taking time to to spend uh, an hour with us here today. And and if you didn't have your pen out and write those links down, they will also be in the YouTube description and in the podcast show notes. So however you heard or saw this. Take a look and you'll be able to find those links so you can just click on them. And a couple of housekeeping closing notes. We have our 
uh, Foreman Basic Training Program running. We're running it right now, and we have our next session starting in January. We only have three spots left. So mm -hmm. if you have a young and up-and-coming four-person who wants to get a leg up on the community and the industry, go ahead and check that out. You can find us. You can find us at www.arcadewayfinding.com. You can find us at the Critical Path podcast.com. Yes, you can. You can find us there. Uh, you can find us on LinkedIn. You can find us on Twitter. And you can find us here on YouTube at www.arcadewayfinding.com forward slash YouTube. And on West Seattle Island. Yeah. We're um, newly an island. We're an island. But uh, you can, you know, <laughs> okay. yeah, if you're not in Seattle, our major <laughs> bridge that connected us to the rest of the city is no more. So Jason cries about it mostly every day. All right. <laughs> we can still get to you guys it's just a little it's bit true. harder that's, that's right. what I told them I said as long as people really want to come they'll still get here so you can come have a cup of coffee if you want to talk to us more we'll see you all next time watch for it thanks so much thanks so much you guys